Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Phoenix City Council Chambers and to our bond committee discussion of parks and recreation. Uh, this is our second meeting. <coughs> I'm Mary Rose Wilcox. I'm the chairwoman of uh, this committee, and I just would like to thank uh, staff and everybody present who was here last time. It went very well. Uh, we had a very good presentation, and uh, we had a lot of people calling in and zooming in. So we have a lot of follow-up today. Uh, the way that we're going to start is we'll have a motion in a few minutes for the minutes of last week. I hope uh, everybody had a chance to review them. And then we're going to hear the follow-up from Cynthia of the, what we asked for last week and what groups asked for. And then I'm going to go into public discussion so that uh, the last part of our meeting is going to be talking about prioritization and we'll get your comments in for that. So that's the way the meeting will run. And if there's any glitches in it, we'll just take care of it, okay? Okay, let's go ahead and just introduce everybody at the table. Dana, you want to start? I learned last time to turn on my mic. <laughs> <laughs> my name is Dana Burns. Uh, Gary Casa. Mary Rose Wilcox. Ellie Bettis Palowski. Brett Hunt. And John Bullock. Okay, thank you, Brent and John. And Elizabeth Perez uh, Pulaski is our vice chair of this group. Uh, and we have Jeff Spellman on um, the uh, computer. Jeff, you want to say hello to everybody? Good afternoon, Jeff Spellman. I'm uh, attending virtually today. Okay, we only have one person missing, Adrian Garcia, who is an independent artist. And hopefully, uh, his punishment for not coming will be giving us a good mural, okay? <laughs> okay, let's get started. Uh, can I get uh, a motion on the approval of minutes from last week? Elizabeth, you wanna give me one? Motion to approve the minutes from our last meeting. Is there a second? I second, Brett Hunt. Okay, any discussion? Okay, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Okay, thank you very much, that passes. Uh, and they were pretty interesting minutes, so if you get a chance to read them, it'll really catch you up to speed on uh, the public presentation that Cynthia Aguilar made uh, last week. Uh, it was the presentation of what the city had put together as to their prioritization. So if you get a chance, you should read it. Okay, let's go ahead and start. And during this meeting, again, we'll be going up over the follow-up. Uh, subcommittee hears presentations and public comment today. And as a reminder, the city has not had a geo bond since 2006, quite a while ago. And so uh, we have significant infrastructure needs um, that exceed the 500 million that we're asking. And so they've assured us uh, from the uh, city manager down that they'll be going out again in a few short years. Uh, so some of what we're gonna be talking today, uh, you know, about today, if it doesn't get prioritized, uh, we will have a second chance and our comments will be carried over. So I just want everybody to know that. I also want everybody to know, because it was this committee, along with probably others, who asked that we have one evening session, and that has been granted. On the 14th at six o'clock, we will be meeting. Um, that meeting will coincide with most of the bond committees already have had their hearings or scheduled for their last ones. So what we will do is only the executive committee will come. That's composed of three civilians at large, and then the heads of the bond committee. So that's who will be hearing that, and we'll make sure we take copious uh, minutes and get them to all of you, okay? But that will help us. Yes, Ingrid? Madam Chair, um, would you like to um, let the Spanish interpreters uh, say a few words too? That sure, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. This is Mario Barajas, and I'll be serving as uh, one of the interpreters, my other colleague, Carmen Cota would also be serving as the interpreter. I'll now take a moment to introduce myself to our Spanish-speaking audience. Hola, buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Mario Barajas y voy a estar sirviendo como uno de los dos intérpretes de esta tarde. La otra intérprete será Carmen Cota. Les pedimos como un favor, si es que van a estar dando un comentario público, de que hablen lentamente, con claridad y evitar distracciones de fondo. De esa manera podemos interpretarles de la mejor manera y completa posible. Muchas gracias. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, 
Um, are you, will you also tell him that we will be having an evening meeting on the date and time? Mario, did you uh, hear uh, the chairwoman's request about the evening meeting, which is September 14th at 6 p.m.? Here, did, did you tell him? Mario, uh, could you please uh, tell the Spanish audience that there is a meeting, an evening meeting on the 14th of September at 6 p.m. here in council chambers or virtually as well? Solo para hacer constar, se está anunciando que para el día 14 de septiembre a las 6 de la tarde habrá una reunión también aquí en la Cámara del Concilio. Gracias, Mario. Okay, let's get started, and then we're going to come back to the prioritization. Uh, why don't we go ahead with public comment? And Ingram, are you going to call them out? Um, uh, Madam Chair, would you like the presentation on what you requested first? Oh, yes. First? Okay. I got so anxious no to hear from the public. It's all good. <laughs> okay. Cynthia Aguilar has uh, taken what we gave her last time uh, and incorporated it uh, into the prior, not, not fully into the prioritization, but into a format that she will share with us now as to some of the ideas we had. So Cynthia, take it away. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee. I'm Cynthia Aguilar, Parks and Recreation Director. Thank you again for, uh, for being here with us during this process. I have many members of my team with me again who helped me prepare for today's presentation. So I'd like to thank them for their help and for being here today to help us answer any questions that may come up at the end. Also, after today, we will be halfway through this process, um, and so we might hear or talk about this a little more later, but um, this is our second meeting, and by the end of the third meeting, uh, we're hoping that the subcommittee will have a list of priority projects, and then by the end of the fourth meeting, have the very final list with them in priority order to recommend in the final report to the executive bond subcommittee. Um, and with that, I will begin my presentation. Uh, I'm pleased to be here today to provide you with follow-up information. Um, to get started, I wanted to just provide a brief recap of the Parks and Recreation Prioritized Geo Bond Projects for anybody who may have missed the last meeting or may be here for the first time. Uh, there are 13 projects we've identified as prioritized projects. Um, and just also as a quick refresher, these projects were based on the parameters we were provided with which include capital projects costing greater than $500,000 with minimal operating cost increases. Uh, projects include design and construction of buildings and infrastructure and major renovations or improvements to existing assets to extend their life or increase service levels. These projects were reviewed, refined, and prioritized by the city's fiscal capacity committee to create a balanced bond project or package with projects across the city in areas identified as priorities by our city council. These projects each fall into one of the five categories. You'll remember this from last uh, or two weeks ago, undeveloped parks, aquatic improvements, park improvements, facilities improvements, and then a project within our South Mountain Park and Preserve. Um, and I'm not going to go through them as I did last time, but uh, this includes two undeveloped park projects located in the northeast and southwest part of the valley. Uh, it would be phase one construction that's included in our prioritized project list. Uh, we also had aquatics improvements to include regional pool concepts at Harmon Park Pool and Maryvale Park Pool. Uh, that project includes the conversion of a total of five pools into splash pads. Uh, also park improvements at Margaret T. Hance, Mountain View Community Center and Sports Complex, uh, Rio Salado, and the Pueblo Grande Museum and Archaeological Park. We also have four projects under the facilities improvement categories, uh, the South Mountain Community Center, South Phoenix Youth Center, Telephone Pioneers of America Park and Recreation Center, and Washington Activity Center and then roadway safety enhancements again within the South Mountain Park and Preserve. We also provided you with a list of what we have identified as future capital needs. This includes development of an undeveloped park property in Ahwatukee, uh, phase one and phase two, and then phase two, which would be completion for the Desert View and Estrella Civic Space Parks, 
uh, redesign of irrigation and turf uh, replacement uh, for a more drought, re, uh, drought tolerant turf at our Cave Creek, Encanto, and Palo Verde golf courses. And then improvements at Esteban Park, a, a replacement project to repair a uh, section of Galvin Parkway, improvements within the Levine Area Conveyance Channel, renovations to Papago Park, and repairs and improvements to several urban lakes within our park system. At the August 15th subcommittee meeting, you asked me to provide follow-up information on a variety of items, including information on other capital funding sources, programs and statistics, impact of our programs and services in the community, and information on additional capital projects. The Parks Department is fortunate to benefit from a voter-approved privilege, license, privilege license sales tax that was most recently approved by voters in 2008 one-tenth of one set in sales tax, or for example, 10 cents of every $100 spent comes to the Parks Department. These funds can be used for land acquisition, park development, repairs, and improvements. 60% of these funds must be allocated for flatland parks and 40% for our mountain preserves. On average, this has brought in approximately $32 million annually. <laughs> There is a 3PI audit committee comprised of members of the public who meet annually to review our annual audit and ensure these funds are being used as they were intended. Wanted to just provide you an example of two projects we recent com recently completed with 3PI funds. On the left, you'll see a uh, master plan. I know it's hard to see the improvements, but this is Nuestro Park. And on the right uh, were improvements we made to Paestawa Peak. Um, and so it could include anything from new ramadas, a playground, resurfacing of courts, but I just wanted to provide you with a couple of these examples to show the kind of two different categories between the 60% and 40% split. You also asked me to bring back information on other funding sources uh, in, in, in top of the 3PI, things that will help us do other capital projects in our park system. In certain parts of the city where new development is taking place, we benefit from the use of impact fees. Impact fees can be used to build new parks or add amenities to existing parks. Currently, the department is using more than $10 million in impact fees to build three new parks and make improvements to two existing parks. The Parks Department also partners with our Neighborhood Services Department to utilize federal community development block grant funds. Uh, known as CDBG funds for various park improvements. Over the last five plus years, we've utilized more than $5 million in CDBG funds for improvements in several parks throughout the city. Each year, we also assess opportunities to apply for a variety of grants. In addition to working directly with the agencies who offer these opportunities, we also work with the city's grant liaison and government relations team in the city manager's office to review and assess grant opportunities. This includes reviewing um, any related requirements, criteria, matching funds, uh, to help us determine what projects we could benefit from. Historically, the department has been awarded grants from the agencies on this slide, but I wanted to share one example, being the Federal Land and Water Conservation Fund. Approximately 59 of our park properties have previously benefited from the Land Water Conservation Fund grants, uh, and currently we're evaluating potential projects for the recently expanded Outdoor Recreation Legacy Partnership Program uh, from the Department of Interior, which would utilize uh, the LWCF funds as they're known, um, and that has an early bird deadline of January 31st of 2023. Uh, uh, we also have received and applied for uh, many tribal gaming grants. Our department most recently received over $20,000 in funding from the Gila River Indian community to renovate two outdoor exhibit areas on the, on the grounds of Pueblo Grande Museum. During our last meeting, you also asked that we bring back information about our programs and statistics, the impact of COVID on our park system, and the overall impact of our programs uh, and services again. The COVID-19 pandemic has certainly had an impact on our park system. Uh, one of the greatest impacts COVID has had uh, is to our aquatics programs and facilities. After closing all pools in 2020, we lost more than 50% of our aquatics workforce. 
Uh, this resulted in opening just 12 of 29 pools last year, 14 of 29 pools this year, despite enhanced lifeguard recruitment efforts and incentive pays. When comparing statistics, however, of the 14 pools that were open prior to the pandemic and those same 14 pools that were open this year, uh, there was an overall 28% decrease in pool use. I do want to note, however, uh, that that is a direct result of our offerings not being the same as they were pre-pandemic as well. So with the shortage of lifeguards, we didn't offer things like um, uh, water aerobics, our swim and dive teams and a few other programs. So that kind of falls in alignment with that uh, decrease. You also asked for data on the demographics of our pool users to guide you in some of your decision making. Uh, and so the information at the bottom of the slide represents a typical year pre-pandemic. Those are 2019 statistics when all pools were last open. You can see more than 466,000 people used our pools with about 73% of them being youth. And then a lot of those adults are adults who come in with the youth. Um, and then we also have some programs for seniors. And when you see that spectators note, that's also people that are coming either to just watch the children, maybe watch a swim and dive team meet, those kinds of activities. We, uh, you know, during the pandemic, obviously we did close many of our fa indoor facilities, as I mentioned. As a result, we did see an increase in our outdoor activities, such as hiking, uh, the number of rounds of golf played, and use of our Walk Phoenix Pass, just to name some. Uh, when comparing the 2019 pre-COVID statistics uh, to our most recent data post or during COVID, we saw an increase of 160% in hiking, 29% increase in rounds of golf played, and an increase of 128% in use of our Walk Phoenix Pass. So naturally, people did turn to the outdoors when our facilities were closed. Another popular amenity pre-COVID and still post-COVID are our community centers. Uh, these facilities provide families and adults across the city with a variety of program options, including both youth, adult, and senior programs. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the pandemic resulted in the closure of our facilities. Eventually, we reopened a limited number, and we had many modifications. Uh, we did look at our summer camp numbers, which was the most recent program we offered uh, in our facilities, in our community centers. And uh, when comparing that data to 2019, we only saw a decrease of 5%. So over 7,400 children uh, returned to use our summer camp programs. In 2019, that number was about 7,800. So we are pleased to see uh, that people are coming back and we know that the need is still there. Uh, our youth sports program is another indicator of this. Uh, we have many programs that we offer and these are both indoor in gymnasiums and then outdoors in our parks. But in looking our, at our recent registration rates for the fall, within our first week of loan, we surpassed our 2019 youth sports numbers. And so we're really thrilled again, just to see um, how much people have come back to using our programs and services. In terms of impact to the community, um, the statistics certainly help paint a picture of uh, how people might use our system and how many people use the different services. But I also wanted to note that affordability and access is really one of the most important things when it comes to our impact in the community. So this slide is really intended to show you the affordability. If, if we, we are really the most affordable programs around in the Valley, and uh, if it wasn't for us, some families might otherwise not be able to participate in these programs. Some examples, you know, our swim lessons for eight lessons, it's $15. If you look at private facilities, it's closer to $120 for four lessons. Um, I'll jump down to our summer camp, you know, our most affordable programs in our larger uh, centers, it's $240 for the whole summer for eight weeks. And if any of you are parents, you know, you know, in a private facility, uh, you pay much more. And on average, we found $1,300 for an eight-week program. I'm going to do my best to try to um, answer the questions that came up about how do we know how these proposed projects, you know, impact the communities around them. Cynthia, before you go on, yes. um, you gave us a lot of the stats that everybody asked for. 
Is everybody okay? Do you want anything else added? Okay, I know, Jeff, you asked for quite a few. Are you okay with what we were presented? And I think, I don't know if you're still with us. Are you okay? okay. All right, thank you, Cynthia. That gives us a real good picture. Uh, and I'm really glad that the numbers are going up. Uh, the pandemic just hit people very hard, so it's good that it's going up. Go ahead. Sure. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so I will get to Desert View Civic Space. This map is really intended to show uh, what the service, the minimum service area is for a community park. Again, this is a 40-acre community park in northeast Phoenix near Deer Valley and Tatum. Uh, and it's, uh, you know, surrounded by uh, some smaller parks that are a little bit further away, but when it comes to the nearest park of its size or larger, that would really be Paradise Valley Park, uh, which is almost five miles away from this location. So in terms of impact, I just kind of wanted to paint that picture so you could see what is and maybe isn't around uh, this particular area. In terms of the Estrella Civic Space Park, again, this is a 93-acre regional park. A regional park is intended to serve a minimum five-mile radius. There are uh, at least 58,000 households in this particular area, and the closest regional park to it is about six miles away, which is Desert West Park. In terms of these locations, it's also important to note that in both cases there are freeways and kind of natural barriers such as that that may also make it a little more challenging or not as easy for residents to get to some of these other park, uh, that parks that may be nearby. And for the Estrella Civic Space, it's an area, although there's 58,000 households now, it is growing rapidly with new home development in the area. So the density in this area uh, continues to increase. The next two projects, you'll recall, include upgrading two of our existing pools to regional pools with enhanced amenities. And in terms of trying to paint or create that picture of the impact, um, both Maryvale Pool and Harmon Pool are located at parks uh, that are highly heavily used parks. They both have community centers. They both happen to have library branches. Um, these are already destination type parks, if you will. So the thought process here, again, is to upgrade these pools where many residents are already accustomed to coming nearby um, for these services to include a pool with many more amenities, which includes the heater, and a pool now that they can get in, to and use year round versus eight weeks, which is what a typical pool is currently open. Uh, I wanted to note in terms of the splash pads for the three that are uh, that would be repurposed into splash pads, Grant Park is just over a half a mile away. Um, the pool at Alkire Park is less than a mile away, and University Park is about one and a half miles away. For the two pools that would be repurposed around Maryvale Pool, Maryview Park is about 1.7 miles away and Holiday Park Pool about two miles away. Um, so again, in trying to paint that picture of the impact, it's really to try to give residents a variety of aquatics amenities, a pool they can get to longer. As a mom of two kids myself, you know, the thought of having access to swim lessons maybe beyond just the months of June and July would be really huge, you know, and then still having use of a splash pad at a neighborhood park that I could walk to you know, at least would provide me with um, options for my family. And that's, again, our intended purpose with these projects. Cindy, can I have a question? Yes. Um, on these splash pads, uh, are you actually going to build them in the pool site, or are you going to cover the pool and build them on top? Um, Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee, it would be a renovation within the existing footprint okay. of that space where the pool is. Okay, so you might raise it a little bit. Yes. And, okay. okay, so we won't take up more of the park space. We're just going to use the space that's there. Okay. That is correct, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you. Yes, Gary? Interesting article in the Republic on the splash pads uh, over the weekend. And I was curious if uh, Phoenix has other splash pads or, or if there are other cities in Maricopa County that have splash pads and how they're used and the popularity. That's yes. my question. Madam Chair, um, subcommittee member Casa and members of the subcommittee, Phoenix does have, I'd have to look at the exact number, I believe we have 10 to 12 splash pads in the park system currently. Uh, we certainly know they are heavily used amenities. Some of them have more 
um, interactive features than others, which is also a factor in how heavily they're used. Some were built many years ago, some are newer. All of those are going to be factors, but they are very popular. Um, and one thing that we're looking at is extending the splash pad season because they are popular. Currently, they open when our pools open, which is Memorial Day weekend, and they close October 1st. So they are still currently open, even though uh, most of our pools have closed. Uh, but we have looked at surrounding areas that have splash pads, and some of them are open longer. When kids get out in spring break, for example, it's already warm. It's in March, and so we're looking, is that the right time to open, or do we open for spring break at least? Um, so we do know that they are heavily used amenities, and they are trending to be very popular amenities. Thank you. I just have a, a follow-up question there, Ms. Aguilar. Um, the issue related to lifeguards, just seeing the number, you know, 14 of 29, um, what a, you know, how sad <laughs> that is. <laughs> Do you know what the projection would be with the regional pools, what the number of lifeguards that would be necessary in this concept versus the current concept? And if that makes that more reasonable to have, you know, obviously more pools open? Sure, great question, Madam Chair, um, subcommittee member Hunt, and members of the subcommittee. I'm going to turn to our aquatics team to see if we know of an approximate number and ask Becky Hewlett, our aquatic supervisor. We obviously know there would be a decrease. I've learned a lot about aquatics over the years. Um, the number of lifeguards required are not dependent on an, the number of people who use the pool, but more its design, um, where there are blind spots and things like that. But Becky could certainly speak to us about um, maybe an approximate number, Becky, like by closing these, by repurposing the five pools do you have a guesstimate of how many less lifeguards that would <laughs> Absolutely, thank you, uh, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Um, at this point, we would probably, with the new facilities, there, they would take more lifeguards than what we currently have at each of those facilities that would be shuttered. Um, so we would, we would then look at approximately, right now we're looking, it's very similar to our Cortez pool, the, that is the, the footprint that we're currently using. And we have approximately 40 lifeguards at that facility. So those two facilities, we would approximately need about 40 people there. As far as projecting what we would need going into next year or the following year when this happens um, to bring the, the pool pools back to the number of staff we need, we had about 400 this year and so by reducing those five pools, adding in um, these additional pools, it is about the same number because we are taking staff from those cl shuttered facilities and moving them to our, our new facility, so to speak. So we're still looking at a projected 550 to 600 people to operate these facilities if we were to get back to full capacity, full programming. Great, thank you. And then just to follow on to that, that may be related to the bond or not, so please tell me if I'm out of bounds here. In terms of um, trying to create that pipeline into, you know, serving as a lifeguard, um, anyway, is there anything germane to our work on the committee or subcommittee that would be helpful to assisting in that pipeline for youth to, you know, think about being a lifeguard, be trained as a lifeguard, and have a great summer job? Madam Chair, uh, Subcommittee Member Hunt, and members of the subcommittee, that's an excellent question. Uh, Becky's team does a lot of work on the recruitment side of this, and so it is separate. It would be a separate, um, a separate thing from the bond committee. So formally, there wouldn't be, since this is really intended to look at capital projects. But we welcome and would love the public's help and support in helping us spread the word about, uh, you know, about those opportunities. We had an aquatics advisory committee that we worked with. So in the future, as we implement some of those recommendations, if people are interested in serving on future aquatics committees such as that, um, if you have feedback, we will take that. Uh, Becky's team is looking at a variety of things. There's a, a shallow lifeguard, uh, <laughs> if you will, that they're like a shallow water lifeguard. So maybe folks who can't complete some, people genuinely have a hard time diving to the bottom of the pool and passing the current lifeguard certification courses. So that could be something that we look into. They're, they're looking into a variety of options and, um, and so we can certainly work with you outside of this process. Thank you very much.
Brett, on that note, uh, last week or two weeks ago when we talked about this, we talked about Phoenix Union uh, and two other board members contacted me and I told them to contact Aquatics because uh, now that Harmon would be a uh, warm pool, we could actually do training there if Phoenix Union wanted to cooperate and maybe get the kids to get a credit and get their lifeguard certificate. So that would be great. So welcome. Great questions, thank mm -hmm. you so much. Uh, moving on to one of the next projects, the Rio Salado, there was a question on whether or not uh, this project for the erosion, embankment erosion control included the multimodal bikeway paths, and it does. Of the 15 miles, eight and a half, a little more than eight and a half of them are multimodal bikeway paths that would be um, protected through this project. And we were also asked if we could look into uh, flood control district of Maricopa yeah. County funding. Uh, we also looked into that and found that that funding is typically awarded for the construction of new projects. This would be considered maintenance of an existing project, so it would be unlikely that we would be able to qualify for those, but it is something that we will continue to look into. Um, also, we were asked to bring back information on investments, either recent or upcoming in the Sunny Slope area. I just wanted to share some examples because although it's not in our uh, current or future bond prioritization projects, we have done a lot and we are doing a lot with other funding, especially 3PI funding, CDBG funds. Um, and so over the last several years, some of those projects have included a lot of lighting improvements, was, which as you know is important to park safety uh, in many of these parks, including uh, Norton and Palma Parks. We also installed a new playground at Mountain View Park, a new Ramada and playground at Norton View Park, I'm sorry, at Norton Park, um, and then various improvements at Sunny Slope Park and Community Center. We mentioned the repair of Sunny Slope Pool recently, uh, and a new playground last year went in at Winterford Green Park. This year, we're also uh, just getting started on the process to make many improvements to the Sunny Slope Youth Center. Elizabeth, I think this were yours. Are you okay yeah. with that? Okay. Okay. Um, just thank you, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Ms. Aguilar. Um, at the Sunny Slope Park, was did you say that there was a new playground installed there, or was it Mountain View Park? The playgrounds were at Mountain View Park. Norton Park, and recently Winifred Green Park. Okay, thank you. Uh, we were also asked to look into a couple new capital improvement projects, one of them being a new recreation center at Esteban Park. Uh, so we have looked into that request and to build something similar to the Fay Gray and Muriel Smith uh, recreation centers, which are about 4,000 square feet indoor recreation facilities. That would cost about four and a half million dollars, and it would have an ongoing annual impact to the budget of about $276,000 annually. We uh, also, Dana, hold on, oh. Dana, I think this was your uh, request. Did you, um, did you look at anything else smaller than that to start, like in phase one? Uh, Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee, we did not, just because this is um, the uh, a smaller recreation center, it truly yeah. is a neighborhood rec center at 4,000 square feet, so it would be hard to do a phase one of that. Okay, is that similar to what we have over by 19th and um, Rozier? Yes, it is. Okay, that's about the same size, okay. Okay, thank you. We also looked into your request at what uh, it would cost to renovate the historic Grant Park bathhouse. Uh, into a flexible recreation space. It's about 1,630 square feet. Uh, and to do the work noted on this screen, uh, to turn it into an active recreation space would be about $1.6 million. If we were to staff the facility and operate it, it would have an annual ongoing impact of the, to the budget of $105,000. Uh, it's important to note we could also look at partnership opportunities. We have an existing one to run Grant Park uh, facility currently, so that's also an option as well. Okay, so you may not have the ongoing cost that high then, okay. And it is a historic building, so we can't take it down, so yeah. That is correct, Madam Chair. I learned that the hard way, so. <laughs> 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 okay, thank you, Cynthia. Sure, and uh, just 
we just have, I believe, a couple more uh, projects left. The one being your request for funding mm -hmm. uh, for minor, minor capital projects that neighborhoods could request. We have confirmed with budget and research that is something we could do. So essentially, again, the thought during our last meeting that you recommended was uh, a pot of money, $500,000, that would be available to neighborhoods to submit an application to the Parks Department to request a new amenity within their neighborhood park. This slide provides just some examples, doesn't have to be these things, of some of those types of amenities and what some of those typical costs are. So if somebody wanted in a, a neighborhood, they could come to you and you could have probably a guideline for them and evaluate whether the project fit into this grant. Yes, Madam Chair, members yeah. of the subcommittee, we would definitely establish criteria and a process to manage that. That's great that the city can be that flexible, so it's good. Okay, thanks. Uh, and lastly, you also asked me to bring back information on our bikeway capital needs. Uh, the Parks Department certainly maintains many miles of back of bike paths that intersect with other jurisdictions and even overlapping responsibilities with some of our partner departments. So this request to look truly look at it holistically will take us a little more time um, to look at that. But I was able to work uh, with my colleague in the streets department who provided some uh, information on what is going through currently through the streets and storm drainage geo bond subcommittee. Um, so Streets Department has confirmed they have seven prioritized projects that are going through that subcommittee, which total $160 million uh, in, request, in requested geo bond funds. Of those seven proposed projects, three include the potential within the overall scope of the projects to create new bicycle lanes or upgrade existing bicycle lanes to make them more safe and comfortable. So those three programs specifically that they shared with me are called the equity-based Transportation, transportation Mobility, um, which is T2050, um, and that's $20 million in their bond subcommittee that is being reviewed. Uh, pavement Maintenance, uh, which is $35 million, and then vis Vision Zero Implementation Projects, which is about $25 million. So again, those are projects that are going through uh, the subcommittee, the storm, the streets and storm drainage subcommittee, uh, but again, we certainly have some bikeways in the Parks Department that we maintain. We utilize other capital funding sources to help uh, with improvements along those bikeways. So I just want to provide that additional information. I said, if, uh, just, ahead, just one, one question related to that. Um, the South Mountain uh, roadway improvements, could that possibly be seen as something that would go into a, the same prioritization on the other subcommittee? So Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee, I'll let Ingrid jump in if there's something uh, uh, she may want to add on that, but the roadways within South Mountain Park are the responsibility of the Parks Department, and because they provide access for park visitors, um, we felt this was the appropriate subcommittee to assess that. And Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee, um, up to a certain point in South Mountain, like the, the entryway streets helps us manage that, but past that, it really is only servicing the park, and so it is really a park road. Sounds great. Thank you. A question on, on what you were talking about, the, the different uh, bike paths. Is this include the 3rd Avenue, that has supposed to come from Mary Hans Park <coughs> all the way to Rio Salado? You know? Um, I, Madam, Madam Chair, members of subcommittee, I'll have to look into that. I'm not sure. Madam Chair, um, are you speaking about the uh, one that was just mentioned um, by uh, the Transportation Secretary? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so that is a different funding pot. Okay. Um, and that is something that will happen through that funding that was announced that particular day. Okay. Um, for those of you who maybe didn't uh, uh, hear that announcement, uh, the Transportation Secretary, the United States uh, Transportation Secretary, announced that there would be connectivity over the Rio Salado at 3rd um, to make connectivity from the north to the south. And that, that will be funded through that project. That's really um, exciting. A lot of people in the neighborhood are really excited about it and uh, want to see how's, how's it going to work. Will there be stops along the way uh, in some of our various parks, or how's that going to work? So, okay, thank you. Any yeah. other questions on that, Dana? Uh, Madam Chairman, Jeff Spellman, I have a, a okay, question. Hold, hold on, we have Dana first, and then we'll get you, Jeff. Okay. Thank you, okay. Madam Chairman. I want to go back quickly to the Esteban Park um, enhancement. I don't know if mm -hmm. if I'm supposed to ask this now or later. Dana, why don't you hold on, let, let Jeff ask the bike question okay. and then we'll get back to that. Okay. That's fine. Jeff, go ahead. Okay, thank you, uh, 
Madam Chair, and Director Aguilar. Thank you for the information on the bikeway capital needs. And uh, I, I did a little more research too after our first meeting and realized that there are monies in the street transportation program. I wonder if there's an opportunity in a future meeting to have someone from the streets department come and give a little bit more detail on the bikeway program that's included in their section of the bond program. We could do that. Um, we can also uh, ask if, if you would like to attend their um, hearings, you know, they would be able to do it at their hearings also. And also the um, executive committee will be reviewing all of the, the requests. So hopefully Jeff, either they can come here, we can, um, you know, get information from their committee or we can prioritize asking about bikes when we go before the executive. Okay. Sure. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I, I plan to attend their meetings as well. I'm just thinking that there's a lot of connectivity between the parks, park facilities, and the bikeways, and it would be good for us to see and understand how those interconnect. Okay, if we have the time, we will do it. Cynthia's going to talk to them and see if they can give an abbreviated presentation. Yes, Madam Chair, members of the okay, subcommittee, we can thank do you. that. Okay, Dina, go ahead with yours now. Thank you, Madam Chair. I had a quick question. Are we this the appropriate time to ask my questions? Go ahead. Okay. So my question is about the enhancement to Esteban Park. I know that was a future project. What process do we as a community um, follow in order to make that enhancement uh, as far as well as the um, recreation center a prioritization? Well, you go through this committee. Mm -hmm. uh, what you do is you know, you've brought it up. Uh, Cynthia's done the work. She's given us how much it cost, and our committee will evaluate it. And if we feel that it's something that we should put forward, uh, we would request that staff look at funding, and we would have to look at what they prioritized and see where the funding could come from. So this is the, the proper place to do it, I believe. Okay. Ingrid? Uh, Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee, yes. Um, you, if you were, if you chose to include this as one of your priorities items, it could either replace something on the list or um, be in addition to it. But remember, again, as we talked earlier, in all uh, subcommittees, there's more needs than there is money, and so um, uh, you know, the the uh, fortunate thing for staff and the unfortunate thing for the committee is this is a tough job, right? And so there has to be some decisions made about what those things will be, and, and that's you know what you guys, and we'll talk about how we do that mm -hmm. um, a little bit later in this meeting, but um, that is unfortunately the, the task that is the committee's task. When we get to the prioritization after public comment, um, there's a few things maybe you could bring up, and they could also tell us whether you could do an architectural part of it uh, you know, to get prepared for phase two or you know, different things like that. Any other questions before we move on? Okay, so yeah. And that, that's it. Actually, Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee, that concludes my uh, presentation. Okay, what these um, presentations were, and Adrian, good to see you here, um, they were basically what we asked last time. And I think everybody's questions got answered. Um, is there anything else that anybody would like to bring up so that Cynthia can have more homework? <laughs> Madam Chair yes, and Ms. Aguilar, a quick clarification. Um, going back to the Sunny Slope capital investments, those were all previous. Those are not future programs or future improvements, right? Uh, Madam Chair, Subcommittee Member Perez Pulowski, uh, they were both. And so I have a list of primarily r recent and previous, and the one that's going on this fiscal year are the improvements to the Sunny Slope Youth, Youth Center. Center. Okay, thank you. Help you? Yes, I need to write current on there. Thank, Thank you, you, Cynthia. <laughs> you were really thorough, and um, the city, you know, uh, is, is looking at this, I think, in a really good manner, giving us the options so that we can make decisions. So, okay. All right, now let's go to public comment. And I believe we have somebody who calls up the speakers. Okay, let's start with our, our virtual. We'll do all of them, and then we'll do the ones here. Did we forget something? Huh? Oh, sorry, city attorney. Okay. <laughs> we thought we were complying with all the legalese, but go ahead. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee. 
members of the public may speak to comment on the general obligation bond program. The city code requires speakers to present their comments in a respectful and courteous manner. Profane language, threats, or personal attacks on members of the public, members of the subcommittee, or staff are not allowed. A person who violates these rules will lose the opportunity to continue to speak. The subcommittee and staff cannot discuss or comment on matters related to pending claims or litigation. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bullen. Okay, let's go ahead now with the virtual. Our first virtual speaker is Karina Dominguez, followed by Christian Sanek. Karina, are you on the line? Yes, I'm here. You may proceed. Awesome, thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Karina Dominguez and I'm a Maryville resident and I'm here to speak in support of the Estrella Civic Space and the Maryville Pool and Splash Pad sites. First, the land where the Estrella Civic Space would exist has been in the city's possession for years and now would be the perfect opportunity to develop it as a green space to allow residents to enjoy the outdoors and have a location where they can engage as a community. Second, I have lived in the Holiday Park neighborhood for nine years, and I believe that the splash pad will increase the park usage, not only for the kids in this neighborhood, but the surrounding ones as well. And this is something that they deserve, especially after going through the isolation of the pandemic. Um, all of the projects that have been presented are extremely important, but I would like to urge the subcommittee to prioritize projects in communities of color that do not always receive these types of resources and funding. Maryville and Estrella Mountain Villages in particular have lacked investments and this is an excellent opportunity to correct this imbalance. Thank you. Thank you, Karina. Next. Our next speaker is Christian Sanek, followed by Chris Murphy. Christian, are you on the line? Yeah. You may proceed. Thank you. Uh, my name is Christian Sanek and I've lived in this community that uh, I'm talking about, which is uh, Mountain View Park for most of my life. I was born in the area and actually uh, played tennis at the park when it was a uh, private facility when I was like four years old. And uh, you may or may not know, they um, turned it they turned it over to the city and the city tore out um, most of the tennis courts there and six tennis courts remain. And so uh, when the pandemic hit, especially, uh, we were waiting, waiting in line to play tennis um, for an hour at a time uh, before getting on the courts. And, it, and that still uh, remains because I don't know how much you're aware, but, but tennis is back on the rise. It was huge in the 70s and, uh, and then kind of died out for a while and it's been back on the rise. It's one of the top, top uh, rising sports. And so I had the idea that uh, they could build some more tennis courts there. Well, because of the, the long waits for playing tennis, I picked up a new sport uh, during the pandemic, which was pickleball, and started playing with some friends and realized that that was better as far as wait times. <laughs> <laughs> Yet we were uh, having to wait to get on courts for quite a while. So we've started playing at five o'clock in the morning uh, at a court that has lights, thankfully. Um, and that, that court just gets absolutely packed and has 10, 15 waiting uh, by 6.30 in the morning, 7 o'clock in the morning, uh, summer, and it's more so in the, in the winter uh, and when um, snowbirds back into town. So those two sports are, are growing, and uh, I don't know if it generated out of my emails or, or if it was already in the works, but I had to use, use that space at Mountain View Park that already existed and already had previously been tennis courts uh, to turn that into a ball and tennis because it's such such in demand and there's such huge weights. Okay, Christian. And, uh, that also happens to be a, yeah. Okay, you have uh, you have two minutes. Uh, it's, it's uh, the bells okay. tell us it's up, but uh, the way it works is we can't really respond to you, but we'll take your uh, questions and remarks into our consideration. And if there's anything that needs to be okay. gotten back to you, Cynthia will get back with you, okay? Thank you very much for your interest. Just more, two more quick comments. Probably Real take 20 fast. seconds. Real fast. Okay. So, um, one, there's already a community center there, so you could charge for the use of the courts. 
Uh, and then two, it is a uh, kind of downtrodden neighborhood and, and this will bring some real good vi revitalization, I think. Okay, appreciate your input. Okay, next. Our next speaker is Chris Murphy, followed by Dan Penton. Chris, are you on the line? I am. You may proceed. Thank you. My name is Chris Murphy and I'm a resident of District 1. I am also a sworn member of the Phoenix Fire Department with nearly 30 years of service to the community. I appreciate the work that both staff and the board is doing for the Go Bond in regards to water conservation. This is more crucial than ever. The reason for my comment today is this. Every citizen of Phoenix needs to be aware of the escalating crisis in the fire department and how it directly affects them and those they care about. Since 2010, the population of Phoenix has grown 21%. And during that time, calls for EMS and fire service have increased by 64%. But unfortunately, the resources to deal with these emergencies, such as firefighters, paramedics, fire trucks, and stations, has only grown by 2% during that same time. In the 15 years since the last bond, we have only added one fire station. As a department, we have worked tirelessly to ensure we get a fire truck to your house within five minutes. Unfortunately, because of rising demand and resources spread to the breaking point, when you and your family need us the most, it is taking us closer to nine minutes, which is not where we want to be. Let that sink in. If your house catches on fire, if your loved one has a stroke, or if a child drowns, you want us there as quickly as possible. If nothing is done, people will die despite our best efforts because we can't get there fast enough to help. Additionally, if you need a ride to the hospital, we only have one ambulance for every 63,000 residents. However, we can make a change that can reverse this dangerous trend. We need full restoration of the fire department's request to the GO bond, which includes four new stations, four replacement stations, 13 additional fire trucks, and seven additional ambulances. We need to move these back above the cut line, so to speak. Without these necessary resources, our ability to help you in your time of need will be greatly diminished. Thank you again for your time and efforts and for allowing me to speak. Thank you, Mr. Murphy. Next. Our next speaker is Dan Penton, followed by Roy Dawson. Dan, are you on the line? Good afternoon, committee, subcommittee. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, I want, I, my name is Dan Penton and I live in Levine area. And I wanted to speak in support of the Estrella Civic Space and the Levine area conveyance channel uh, improvements. Um, Estrella Village has been, you know, seems like it's been long forgotten with regards to its park sites. And the regional park here that was proposed in, you know, 20, nearly 20 years ago um has never has never come to fruition um instead there's been you know large tracts of industrial and uh, multi-family developments and single family homes um and, and and the loss of agriculture but there's been no there's been the the the, the public parks and have not have not met demand they have not kept their development hasn't kept pace um they are in desperate need of, of open space um you know, green space, you know, a civic center for, for place to gather and have, you know, community meetings and classes and everything that everything the community benefits from in other areas of, the, of Phoenix. It's all lacking here in Australia. So I would implore you to, you know, to approve that. Um, so it, it improves their quality of life down in Australia Village. Um, for the Levine area conveyance channel, um, this is such a, you know, you know, I just I've been writing this on my my bike the past few nights, and I'm on you know member of the block watch my community's block watch, and um, I'm very involved in the community. And there's always been, you know, a lot of concerns about the um, um, disrepair and the and the and the overall state of the conveyance channel. That was supposed to be developed as a nice greenway and you know er, you know a, a bike path and pedestrian path for the community. You know. And it looked largely blighted along the entire length of it. And this is a this is an area that's got several parks that are directly attached, uh, two of which have remained undeveloped. But I would, you know, you know, I'm very adamantly, you know, request that you guys consider that and prove that as well because the community needs it. Thank you for your okay, time. Thank you very much. Next, our next speaker is Roy Dawson followed by Peter Lumiansky joining us in Upper Council Chambers. Roy, are you on the line? I am, thank you very much. You may proceed. Thank you, um, Madam Chairman and members of the committee. 
My name is Roy Thomas Dawson. I currently reside in Goodyear, Arizona. However, 70 years ago, I was nine years old and lived and worked in the family business, which was housed near the corner of 40th Street and Broadway Road in the Okima community. My parents, Reverend Robert and Mrs. Perlina Dawson and their eight children were in the farming business. Specifically, we picked cotton. Like most of the colored folks and Negroes who lived in Phoenix, we were recruited from Texas, Arkansas, Louisiana, and Oklahoma to do the work that was considered suitable for us. Our houses were close to the field, and as long as we went and came, stayed in our place, we were pretty much left alone to make our way with what we were given or allowed to have. Seventy years ago, all of Arizona schools were segregated and separated. All our teachers were colored or Negro, as were all, all our school administrators. The only playground and pool in a colored or ne Negro in the community was East Lake Park, some 5.5 miles away from my house. The only other recreation or playground options we had was to stay after school use the ball diamonds or the dirt basketball courts, find a vacant lot near the house and build our own playground and try to learn to swim in the unsafety of the canals that fed the fields near our home. Consequently, I was a junior in college before I learned to swim. It was also during that period of time that I formed my cotton picking mind. My mind was what I had was all I was going to get. And to ask for more was culturally discouraged and physically dangerous. I have since gone on to finish in the Roosevelt Elementary School District, started South Mountain High School, but my worked my way through the Los Angeles City High School okay. and University Mr. Dawson, I, I'm sorry. We have a time limit, but are you calling in support of East Lake Park? No, I'm calling for Esteban Park. Okay, park so you're calling in support, okay. Well, we appreciate that, and we will note that on the record. I'm sorry we had to cut you short, but we limit everybody to two minutes. Perhaps we should have oh, told you at the beginning, okay. but thank you for your history. Thank you for cutting me off. I appreciate anything you do for Esteban Park. Okay, thank you. Okay. We now have speakers in the audience, and I believe we have um, a group who is here and had wanted to speak, but they're going to have one speaker take six minutes uh, so that we can um, not have, I think, about 11 people speak. So you want to raise your hands? Where are you? Madam yes. Chair, there's, there's about five total speakers, that, okay. um, and there's one group that didn't bring all their people because they're going to speak for one. So the rest of the people, I think there's like six more people, seven more people, eight more people. So there's eight more people, but one is going to speak for oh, okay. the longer and period of time. And we'll give them extra Everybody time else has that. individual okay. comments. Okay. So why don't we take that one speaker first? Come on up over here. Our next speaker will be Sandra Bassett, joining us in the Upper Council Chambers. Thank you. Um, you should have received packets from me that I ask if you have an opportunity to please review that will outline the details of what I'm about to share with you. My name is Sandra Bassett. I am the CEO for the Phoenix Center for the Arts. I'm here presenting today because we are in dire need of your help and our building is maintained by Parks and Rec. Imagine you're driving on the I-10 and you come up at 3rd Street from the HOV lane. You're entering into the revitalized downtown area. You look ahead and you wonder, what is that? Or you're coming into downtown from 3rd Street or you're leaving from 3rd Street and you look over to your right or left and you see the beautiful Margaret T. Hans Park and there's some buildings there and again you ask yourself, what is that? Well, it is the Phoenix Center for the Arts. 
and we have been there serving now for over 45 years. What you're seeing off Third Street is the First Southern Baptist Church established in 1921, with the church being constructed in 1931, and again, it is now the Third Street Theater, and a part of what is the Phoenix Center for the Arts and includes the theater, our attached main office, our visual arts building, which is also having uh, uh, particular connections to the adjacent vacant formal sanctuary now known as the North Building. Yes, we are Parks and Rec property, and we are located on the same property as the Margaret T. Hance Park. We serve over 35,000 people annually, and we are the home to eight nonprofit resident organizations, and we serve over 50 diverse and inclusive nonprofits for whom we reduce barriers to arts and culture engagement. We provide economic opportunities for over 50 artists in addition to the staff and other contracts on contractors that we employ. I'm here to ask for your assistance today because our building is in dire need of repair. This repair has been deferred for over, for many decades at this point. We are working with the city um, to resolve some of the building issues and that will help us to look good on the outside, but there's many issues that remain to be mitigated on the inside and that's why we're presenting here today. These issues are related to flooring in which years of roof leakage has resulted in the severe deterioration where you can physically pick apart the tile and pick apart the wood that is still damp many months after rains have occurred. We need HVAC for our youth theater and they spend time in that area without any air conditioning so they have fans in which they can use. Our ceilings have years of water absorption without remediation, which now appear to have mold, and I'm having internal testing done. We are getting to the point of closing off areas of participation due to these and other health and safety issues. As again, I stated, I submitted to you a detailed packet of information which shows it, and it also includes estimates for this repair that can be done. For over 45 years, we have served the Metro Phoenix community, and we need your immediate help so that we can continue to serve today and also for 45 more years. We want to be a part of the revitalization and not look as if we're abandoned in a unhoused population attraction. So we're asking for your help to be able to continue to provide arts and cultural opportunities for the over 35,000 people that we serve, which includes the annual Mayor's Arts Awards and also the Phoenix Festival for the Arts. Again, this is not something that can wait five years. We have passed that limit the constant rain, the ceiling tiles falling on your head, being careful where you walk because the floors have deteriorated, have gotten us to the point where we are really having opportunities that inhibit our ability to engage from an arts and cultural perspective as we have for the past 45 years. We appreciate the opportunity that we've been given by Parks and Rec for this incredible partnership that has occurred that has allowed us to be able to serve. But we have to address these issues because they cannot wait until the next bond. The time for us, the time for the 35,000 people that we serve, the time for us to be a part of the revitalization of downtown Phoenix is now. I thank you for your time and your consideration of this request. If there's any questions, I'll be more than happy to answer them at this time. The role of this committee is to receive the input and we will take that into consideration. I believe the funding would come from the Arts and Culture Committee. Not completely and correct. If it, if it doesn't, uh, we will look at it, and Cynthia will guide us on that, okay? Thank you. Thank you for that. And again, our contract is with the city through Parks and Rec for our building, which is why I'm presenting the portion of the building here today to you. Thank you again for your time and your Thank consideration. You, Madam. Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee, that packet, we'll give it to you afterwards, okay. just because we didn't want it to disrupt you while we're hearing from other okay. people. Okay, so. thank you. Right, now we have um, five other speakers, I believe. Yes, I think there's a few here on different topics and Sarah will call them. Okay. There are a total of 10 more in-person speakers. Our next speaker is Peter Lumiansky, followed by Suhani Patel. Peter, please come to the podium. <coughs> Oh, Madam Chair, uh, I may need an extra 30 seconds, but I'll talk fast. 
Uh, good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the Parks and Rec Subcommittee. My name is Pete Lumiansky. I'm a retired Navy captain living in Phoenix for the past 32 years. I was on active duty for 27 years, mostly as a helicopter pilot. In 1989, I retired in Phoenix and I was appointed by Mayor Terry Goddard to be a commissioner on the USS Phoenix Commission with the mission of befriending the nuclear-powered fast attack submarine named after the city, the USS Phoenix, SSN 702. Ever since then, we've been involved in working on a plan to save some of the parts of the submarine and place them in a downtown park as the centerpiece of a Cold War mon monument honoring all those military and defense civilians who together cracked the back of the Soviet Union and allowed us to prevail in the long and stressful Cold War period, 1946 to 1991. For the past 30 years, we've worked with seven mayors and seven parks directors to find a spot for the monument, design and get approval for a monument concept, and to fund the project. We now have an approved spot in Steele Indian School Park within sight of the Arizona Veteran Home and the VA Hospital, an approved monument design, and after 18 long years, the Navy cut the boat up and we have 65 tons of its parts stored here in Phoenix. For the past three years, despite the pandemic, we've raised over $100,000 in cash and received over $100,000 in pro bono services. However, there are small numbers compared to the estimated 3.6 million necessary to build the monument. My wearing a uniform today symbolizes the very large Army, Navy, Air Force, Coast Guard, Marine Corps population of veterans who deserve thanks and recognition for their many sacrifices during the Cold War. The monument is designed to recognize and preserve our history, honor the service of those military and civilian persons who confronted a menacing enemy, and educate everyone, but especially our young persons, about the often overlooked and unknown contributions of our magnificent and highly sophisticated submarine force. Our monument theme can be summarized as learn, honor, remember. This mature, shovel-ready monument will truly enhance Steel Indian School Park and become a unique, popular, and photogenic point of pride for our city and state. Please pay, take the time to review the materials that I'm leaving with you today, and thank you very much for listening and request you allow our project to compete on the prioritized capital needs list of the Parks and Rec Geo uh, Program. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Next. And Madam Chair, that handout we'll give to you at the okay. end as well. Our next in-person speaker is Anita Thiessen, followed by Suhani Patel. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the subcommittee. My name is Anita Thiessen, and I'm the chair of the board of the Arizona Science Center. I've had the honor of serving on the board for the last 12 years. I'm pleased to be here today on behalf of our 46 board members and the hundreds of thousands we engage with every year. We want to support the Arizona Science Center's general obligation bond funding proposal. A proposal, if approved, will secure an additional 40 million of private funding. This funding will be transformational for the Science Center, expand its impact in downtown Phoenix, and enhance programs and experiences for all Phoenicians. For reference, we received 5.4 million from the bond that we, um, the 2006 bond, and we raised a further 24.6 uh, million to fund capital improvements at that time. Nearly 30 years ago, with city bond funding, the Science Center opened its doors to the public in its current location. Since then, it's been a key resource for informal STEM learning for residents of the city. In addition, Arizona Science Center has been a key part of the tourism industry. While Arizona Science Center is both a cultural and learning asset for this city, it is also located in a parks and recreation facility. And it's why we have submitted our funding request to this committee. We have the opportunity with this funding now to grow the impact and appeal of the center to better engage our audiences and attract an anticipated one mission additional out of town tourists to Phoenix in the next 10 years. A stronger and more impactful Arizona Science Center will bring a better informal learning resource for the more than 190,000 Phoenix residents who visit annually and help the Science Center reach more youth. The Science Center plays a key role in inspiring the next generation to pursue careers in STEM. As the city of Phoenix continues to successfully attract and grow STEM-focused industries, the need for skilled workers will be a major factor in maintaining support for these companies. 
Arizona Science Center has a proven track record in supporting educators, students, and industries in STEM education. The expansion of the Science Center galleries will allow the Science Center to support more educators, more students, and more families. Thank you for your time and consideration of including the Arizona Science Center in the General Obligation Bond Program. Thank you. I, I had a question. Um, I know we're not supposed to give any feedback, but are you going to, uh, at the next meeting, give us if these projects are eligible and what would the cost be just so that we can look at them? So Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee, if that's the direction of the subcommittee, we certainly could do that. Um, we are getting closer and closer to our, our deadline. Yeah. Um, we do have that, uh, the information that we obviously will give to you. Okay. Um, and so, if, you know, if, if there's something specific you want us to bring back, we certainly can well, do that. Well, uh, is there, are any of these projects in other committees? Um, I guess that's a big question. Uh, there are, they have some of them, like, just like the fire department yeah. request. Mm -hmm. I mean, some people are going to multiple committees as okay. well. Um, and, and again, I think when it gets to the executive committee, mm -hmm. There might be some discussion there about overlap, um, and again, that's going to be at that probably executive level committee okay. um, standard. But but if there is something specific you want us to bring us back for next time, we can certainly uh, do that um, after we hear some of the conversation here. Okay, I think if we could just get a, a little summary of uh, the request and the, the amount they're requesting, uh, so that we can take into consideration. Uh, and on the ones that are not really germane to our committee, perhaps we don't fire. We couldn't fund, fund a fire department. Obviously. You know, um, and i do not not so sure about the monument either, but maybe you can uh, give us some guidelines on those. And the arts and culture, um, I'm not sure because I'm sure arts and culture, you should look at that. So maybe they just did a bring it to, uh, Madam Chair, they did bring it to that group as okay. well. Um, and again, because because it's in a parks and recreation facility, I think they okay. believe they could bring it here as well. So they, I think that's the reason why. Is that okay with everybody so that we can just look at and what the cost What, what is the amount, we can hear right now, what is the amount of your request um, our, for? Our request, 6.8, 6.8 million. Oh, just a little request. So, <laughs> just a little <laughs> request. <laughs> so if that helps but if you that. give us the seed, <laughs> but with this little seed money, we grow it into something much bigger. We are very good at bringing together private funding okay. sources yeah, you once have we a have the public program. funding. Okay, thanks. Okay. <laughs> okay. If, if I may, Madam Chair. Yes. Um, as long as the the comments are about the bond okay. um, program. Okay. You can uh, ask questions and offer feedback. You okay. don't have to, but you can. Okay, we'll try to limit it, but it just gives us more clarification when we can. So, all right, thank you. Next, please. Our next speaker is Suhani Patel, followed by Claudine Wessel. Suhani, are you here in person? Yes. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the subcommittee. My name is Suhani Patel, and I am a senior at Paradise Valley High School Crest, which stands for the Center for Research, Engineering, Science, and Technology. And it is a career and technical education program that's offered at my school. I've been on the Science Center's Teen Advisory Board for about the past three years, and I can proudly say that it is one of the most rewarding experiences I have encountered in my life thus far. My involvement with the Science Center has had a big impact in my life in three main ways. Um, firstly, it has allowed me to develop an immense passion for engaging teens across the valley in STEM. And I feel this is really important because for kids that are my age, I feel when they navigate their own passions um, at um, an age that's like early on, then I think it's um, better when they can understand um, certain passions for like future careers, for example. Um, and the Science Center has also helped me find my place in a like-minded community of students who share just as much enthusiasm for, for science as I do. And together, we have done an incredible job um, executing and developing various events at the Science Center through efficient teamwork. And lastly, I think most importantly for my personal life, the Science Center has helped me navigate my passion for chemistry and allowed both me and hundreds of other students to conduct year-long projects um, for specific areas of research that we're interested in and present our findings at the Arizona Science um, and Research um, Engineering Fair, which is a um, important opportunity that the Science Center supports. 
Throughout my time at the Science Center, I've come to realize that every person that walks through its doors walks out having learned something new or having developed a newfound appreciation for science. It is a place I have grown up with and a place that I can only hope that future generations of students have the same opportunity to connect with. I'm happy to be here today to support the Science Center and its mission to engage students in science. I want uh, to give a quick thanks to Madam Chair and members of the subcommittee for um, their time and consideration in including the Arizona Science Center in, a, in the GO Bond program. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker. Yes, we have a question. Madam Chair, I just want to say as a fellow Paradise Valley Unified School District alumni, thank you for your comments. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Our next speaker is Claudine Wessel, followed by Guy Labine. Claudine. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee. My name is Claudine Wessel, and I live in North Encanto Historic District with my wife and two daughters, ages five and eight. We have an amazing opportunity before us to enhance space and offering of one of Arizona's beloved family attractions, Arizona Science Center. I've been bringing my children to Arizona Science Center for years, and each visit brings a new spark of joy and excitement. I know a trip to the Science Center will be both fun and an educational day. The additional funding provided by the bond will allow the Science Center to continue to bring new exhibits to, br to keep us engaged and learning. Also, my children have had the particular pleasure of attending Arizona Science Center's Camp Innovation. Each uh, week-long camp empowers my daughters to ask questions and, above all, focus on hands-on learning helps them develop a variety of skill sets, including problem solving, critical thinking, creativity, decision making, leadership, entrepreneurship, acceptance of failure, which is a tough one, and more. Regardless of my children's future career paths, these skill sets go a long way to prepare them to be innovative and confident in the classroom and beyond. The funding proposed for Arizona Science Center would allow the opportunity to create more spaces to offer more camps and learning opportunities to more students each year. The Science Center is one of my family's go-to places when we have friends and family come into Phoenix for a visit, and I hope our city will continue to support it so we can offer these wonderful experiences in the future. Once again, thank you for your time, your consideration in including Arizona Science Center in the Go Bond program. Thank you. Our next speaker is Guy Labine, followed by Charles Dar. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the committee and staff. I'm Guy Labine. I'm the Hazel A. President and CEO of the Arizona Science Center. And it's my pleasure and privilege to be here to talk about this transformational opportunity to invest in the Science Center, an investment that will impact the entire tourism and STEM landscape in every parts of this city. Since 1997, the Arizona Science Center has welcomed 10 million guests, contributing $1.5 million to the local economy, generating 17,000 jobs. In the last 10 years alone, the Science Center has welcomed 400,000 City of Phoenix students through on-site field trips with 240,000 of those uh, provided at no cost to Title I students in Phoenix. The City of Phoenix is a key partner to the Arizona Science Center. We operate in a city building, and the support we receive from the city is paramount to our success. We are now embarking on a significant and exciting and urgent endeavor to incorporate improvements to major building features, galleries, and systems to improve the efficiency of the center and provide a healthier and more comfortable and impactful learning experience for our guests. This investment will translate to more jobs, more tourists to Phoenix, more students serve, more educators trained and supported, and more savings to our operating costs. We will welcome over 5 million visitors in the next 10 years. And it's important to know that this funding is not only an investment in the Science Center, but will add $600 million to the local economy over the next 10 years. These efforts will help develop a more engaged and motivated future workforce directly linked to the city's goal of attracting and growing STEM industries. Our work will also help accelerate learning and growth for K-12 Arizona students. It will support the economy, our growing workforce, the intellectual development of our children, 
and the communities we serve. Thank you for your time and consideration in including the Arizona Center in the Gold Bond Program. Let me ask a question. Um, did, did you, are you qualified for CDBG monies? Have you applied for them? For city? For community block grant development monies. I'm not sure, that's a good question. I would ask yeah. my, we are. Yes. I'm told by my team we are, Madam Chair. Okay, because what we had asked of um, Cynthia uh, Aguilar is that she give us other resources uh, because, as you know, we have a lot that are on plate, and I just didn't know if you were qualified for that or had considered applying for that. We would. We absolutely will apply for every and all funding, and as our board chair indicated, we have a good track record in leveraging city money to be able to attract capital from the private sector and other sources. Okay, I, I know you have big capital campaigns at times, so, all right. Thank you very much for your Thank presentation. Thank you. Our next speaker is Charles Dar, followed by Trent Martin. Uh, hi, a little nervous, but um, my name is Charles Dar. I'm a lifelong resident of Phoenix. I was born in Maryville Hospital and went to school in the Cartwright School District in the 90s. Uh, as a student at John F. Long Elementary, I became aware at a young age of the influence that negative peer pressure can have on children, especially in underserved communities where kids have lots of time to hang out on their own. By the time I was a student at Desert Sands Junior High, I watched several friends I grew up with fall victim to the persuasive efforts of gang recruitment. And for the kids who di didn't succumb to that pressure, many of them faced bullying by those who did. But around that same time, I became friends with a group of friends that they all skateboarded, and I began skating with them. And I was immediately captivated not only by the fun and the challenge of learning to ride a skateboard, but by the community that skateboarding provided me. Um, together, my friends and I, we created our own sphere of influence. Um, in which we learned to encourage and mentor each other. And that mutual mentorship helped, helped us feel secure about rebuffing challenges to prove ourselves to those who we perceived as the cool kids, the type of challenges that would have gotten us into trouble. Um, the rewards of skateboarding replace our needs for their approval. Um, so what does that have to do with Parks and Rec? Well, the most significant facilitator of our outlet was the opening of Desert West Skateboard Plaza on 67th Avenue in Canto. Um, the park gave us a place to nurture our recreation and to meet and become friends with other kids throughout our neighborhood who also enjoyed having an escape from the social anxieties that plague so many marginalized communities. Um, <clears throat> sorry, I usually don't get nervous public speaking, but I am. Okay. Um, I'm here today to testify to the benefits of skateboarding and to encourage this subcommittee to consider what my friend Trent, representing uh, Cowtown Skate Nonprofit, will be pro pro proposing about pursuing a new approach to funding public skateboarding infrastructure in a more equitable way that'll serve more kids growing up in communities like the one that I grew up in. Without getting into the physical and mental health benefits, I can assure you that there are significant social benefits to kids who have access to skateboarding, and I hope to see a day when those benefits aren't reserved for a select few who are lucky, lucky enough to live near a skate park like I was, or whose parents are lucky enough to have the luxury to drive their kids across town, and instead are available to kids who live anywhere within skating dif distance of the 185 parks that we currently have. Thank you for your time. We will ask if there's anything in the bond uh, that will address skateboarding and get back to you, okay? okay I, I, I don't, I didn't see anything that we were looking at that would enhance it. I know the 67th or uh, on, at Desert West really, really was popular. So let's see. It and we do, we just can fund capital projects. You know, we can't fund programs. I, I'm, yeah. I don't know if you're. We we are we're aware that we're a little late to to this. Mm -hmm. You know, this just came on our radar recently. Okay, it's good. So to we are kind of though. here to just get it on the record and to try to seek guidance from the subcommittee. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Trent Martin, followed by Cindy Vaughn. Hi, I apologize if I go over just a few seconds, but. My name is Trent Martin. I'm co-founder of a local nonprofit called Cowtown Skate. Skateboarding has always given kids a healthy outlet in their own place within a community. So we work hard to make skateboarding accessible to as many people as possible. We do fundraising events, park activations, and givebacks to provide new skateboards and shoes to communities in need. We also organize skate park projects so kids can have safe places to skate. Our team has done a lot of work with the city parks and rec department since the early 90s when we all helped to get Desert West Skate Park Plaza built in Maryvale. We're still doing this today as we work on the latest skate plaza breaking ground for its first phase next month at Solano Park near Christown. 
We want the city of Phoenix to continue embracing skateboarding and become the most skatable city in the world. One of the ways we can do this is by using funds smarter on projects that serve more neighborhoods instead of just spending money and efforts to make a spot unskatable or always building multi-million dollar facilities. We want to integrate smaller skate spots and obstacles throughout all existing and future city parks and neighborhoods. This way, anyone who skates has somewhere that they can go that's near their house, just like kids who play basketball all have a basketball court in their neighborhood park. Current general bond capital needs prioritized projects range from $1 million to $23 million per project. For example, the rec center improvements for Telephone Pioneers of America Park is $2.7 million. It's awesome for people who live near the park and can use the rec center. For a similar budget, our approach would deliver safe skate spots to over 100 neighborhoods throughout the city, giving kids a positive outlet, activating parks, and benefiting constituents of every council person's district. So we're here today to seek the additional 400,000 in funding needed to complete the second phase of Solano Skate Plaza and to see how we can go about submitting a proposal for the committee's consideration for these smaller skate spot projects. May 31st, 1997 was the grand opening of Desert West Skate Park and a pivotal moment in skateboarding history. Phoenix listened to the community and was on the forefront of skateboarding. After seeing the success, cities from all over the country quickly followed suit. It's time for the city to reinvent themselves and their commitment to skateboarding. That's why we want to change the approach. Okay. Thank you I, for your time. Just a question. Solano is the Desert West Park? No. Solano is all the skate parks. None of them are in central Phoenix. They're all on the outskirts. Okay. We've been working with the city for years trying to get a skate park in central Phoenix. Mm -hmm. Solano has been approved, but it's only been approved for half of the budgets. They're going to build the first phase of it, which it's skatable, but it's not the entire park. And so yeah. that's... That's Thank what that you. one is. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Madam Chair. If members of the subcommittee, yes. I can add for Solano Park. That's in the works now. We're investing over $700,000 to do for that. phase one of that skate plaza. Where is Solano Park? It's near Chris Town Mall on 15th Avenue, oh, okay. Montebello. So it's central. Mm -hmm. okay. Our next speaker is Cindy Vaughn, followed by Chanel Tao. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the subcommittee. For the record, my name is Cindy Gahn, Senior Director of Phoenix Community Alliance. I speak on behalf of the Board of Directors and the membership of Phoenix Community Alliance. And for some background, we are a 39-year, almost 40-year-old nonprofit organization. We're a business leadership, community leadership organization representing downtown Phoenix. The Margaret T. Hans Park is a greater Phoenix regional park, not merely a downtown neighborhood park. Hans Park is a central meeting point conveniently located in downtown Phoenix for Phoenix, West Valley, East Valley, North Valley, and South Valley residents and beyond for public gatherings, events, and recreation. Hans Park is the flagship park of the city of Phoenix, and when renovations are complete, the park will reinvigorate the economic, cultural, and social life of what happens in Phoenix and continues as it becomes a thriving world-class city. With quick access from public transportation right off the light rail, Hans Park promotes health and wellness, open community gatherings, and equitable access to Phoenicians from all walks of life. This is equally important because of the influx of residents coming from the neighborhoods immediately surrounding and adjacent to Hans Park. This park needs to be more usable on a daily basis in addition to the special events, and this funding will make it possible. Phoenix Community Alliance's Hans Park Fundraising Committee is raising private funds and has been re raising private funds successfully to revitalize this park. We ask that the city continues to be our partner in this endeavor through the Hans Park Partner Coalition as we work with the city and the Hans Park Conservancy. Unlike some other identified projects, the revitalization funds will not increase operating costs. In fact, because of increased efficiencies, they may even be decreased. It's urgent that this project be funded now to maintain the former momentum, and I respectfully request okay. the full staff rec recommended funding amount of $17,835.28 for this prioritized capital needs project. Thank you very Thank much you very for your much. time and consideration. I think we have two more speakers, and then we have to get to our prioritization. So, Yes, ma'am. 
Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the committee, subcommittee. My name is Chanel Poe, and I'm here as an unaffiliated community member uh, in support of the capital uh, renovations to uh, South Phoenix Community Center, a point of pride, a place where people in the community gather over the years. And I have an upcoming training, and I'm getting ready to go there, and I'm like, uh, where is the technology? Where is the bright furniture? Where is the fresh coat of paint? Um, I do support the, the uh, capital for the improvements of South Mountain Community Center, uh, but I implore you to look at technology updates if we want to keep our children and our residents in tune with updates that is occurring, whether it be school, education, or a pathway to employment. Um, we need to make sure that we have accessibility. If they're having accessibility in the classrooms, we should have them within our local community centers. Um, again, I am here in support of that particular measure. And I don't know what you can do outside um, mm -hmm. to beautify that piece, but you know, again, uh, the residents of South Phoenix who may not be able to conveniently get in a vehicle and travel to other community centers such as Pecos, uh, we would also like this to be a crown jewel in our community as well. So please do look forward to uh, brainstorming and thinking of ways that we can update the technology so we can continue to utilize the fullness of our facilities. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, our final speaker. Our final speaker is Thomas Claiborne. Thank you. Uh, my name is Thomas Claiborne IV. I am a resident of, of South Phoenix as well. I live off of 24th and Broadway, and I was here to just be able to bring my support for the Esteban Park. Um, if um, also same thing as you heard from Mr. Dawson earlier, 70, 70 years, this has been a community that's been neglected in many ways, very under-resourced, very underserved. Um, I am a current resident. I have a six-year-old, a four-year-old, a two-year-old. Um, my neighbors are of Mexican descent, and the same thing, they have four-year-olds. And again, this is a community that I've heard the words um, stated earlier today of just the concept of balance and prioritization. It seems like the big emphasis of words. And I would just like to, for the board to take into consideration the long history of unbalance and misprioritization as you consider um, putting in place what's needed for, for this park. Um, that would be a great space for to be improvements for, as Mr. Dawson stated, um, they're just the physical recreational spaces. The closest thing is probably something near as like a croc center but that has not been provided by the city and it for our residents is not very affordable and it's not very accessible for a lot of the residents. And that would probably be the closest recreational, affordable um, access for most residents. And um, for me, again, uh, this is an opportunity to right the wrongs and also to be able to put it in place for this new generation, like my children and Mr. Dawson's grandchildren, as he heard earlier. So thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, that concludes our speakers. Yes. Madam Chair, just uh, to answer your question about the, the uh, requested okay. amount mm -hmm. um, for the monument, it was $3.6 million. And again, we'll get you that packet information okay. uh, once we're done today. And the Phoenix Center for the Arts, if you took out what they had proposed for the North Building, which is currently mm -hmm not something that um, is uh, available to them available because to them. Latino okay. Cultural Center has that as far as um, a current situation, about $8 million for the Phoenix Center for the Arts for their various requests. And you heard the Science Center was 6.8. Okay. So just to give you those facts to help you in maybe okay. uh, some of your decision yeah. about what you might want to ask us to bring I know you're talking about Solano. What would be the, the second phase of funding? Solano? Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee, I'd have to look at that number. It probably is over $500,000 at this time. That would be the skateboard second phase. Or mm -hmm. second phase. Okay, thank you very much. Um, let's go ahead now and look at um, pri priorities um, in terms of our next steps. One of the things that I think we need to do and just comment um, is look at what the city has given us. What's the total bond package for the parks? Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee, let me pull that up one second. Okay, but look at that. 
and look at all of the projects that have been uh, prioritized by the city and then talk about the projects that came forward last week that we got a lot of information on and then uh, ask uh, Cynthia to put together a brief summary of the projects that came in this week. I also would like in looking at uh, the projects that came in, how many, if there's different ways, if we funded a portion, can they use that as leverage? Uh, do you have to spend it within the five years or how, how does that work? Uh, Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee, the first uh, question you asked was 109 million was the prioritized list okay. for um, the parks bond. Um, and yes, um, that money would need to be spent in the five years. Um, and if, I don't know if uh, you'd like to say anything more, Chris, about that particular item. Madam Chair, the one, the one yes. thing I would advise on that on phasing projects is we found during the 2006 bond program, uh, sometimes that led to challenges and okay. partial funding resulted in nothing occurring as opposed to full funding for a project, unless the project lends itself to being phased. So if somebody had a project and went out full force for the next few years and raised money and came in and said, hey, we raised 4, 000, 4 million, can you look at 2 million? That would be a different kind of look than just funding right now a million toward the six. Madam Chair, so in a scenario where um, an organization were to start a fundraising effort, that might lend itself to a proposal during the next bond program to, have, exactly to have cash in hand and, and come into the process. But it would be very difficult to fund a portion of it right now when there's nothing else there. Madam Chair, the, the, um, the, the challenge is that in those scenarios where there's an unknown second mm -hmm. set of funding, that often those, those projects may not materialize if, yeah. if the additional funding doesn't materialize. So, Cynthia, if you can give us uh, just a rundown of what we heard and um, some background so that we can look at those projects next week. But for this week, why don't we go ahead and uh, prioritize? Uh, how do you want us to, what are the rules for it? And we can start. Okay. Yes, Madam Chair. So as, as you've mentioned, uh, the executive committee has directed subcommittees to identify the highest priority items for this bond program that cannot reasonably be deferred. I'd like to point out it's important for the public to be aware that the subcommittee's recommendation will not mark the end of this process or the final opportunity to weigh in. The executive committee will continue to receive public input as will council later this year. Uh, that said, the subcommittee has two meetings after today to develop and finalize your recommendations. Staff recognizes that this is a challenging task. We're at about the halfway point in the process here. In order to come to a recommendation, the committee will need to first determine the list of projects that are to be evaluated, um, much like the discussion that we're having, having now, identifying that universe of projects to be considered. The committee will need to determine the rank order of those projects. In some cases, the committee may want to propose an increase or a decrease to project costs identified by staff, for example, for a lump sum project or for considering phasing of a project. And finally, the committee will need to determine which projects are not going to be moved forward to the executive committee. With there being only four meetings to complete this work, the subcommittee will need to finalize the list of projects to be considered no later than the end of the next meeting, so we can go into the fourth meeting prepared to have the committee deliberating on rank order. Once the total population of projects is settled, the subcommittee will then need to work through relative priorities and costs. Uh, there's not a prescribed method for how the subcommittee will tackle that process. But staff have set up an optional process to help facilitate that decision making if that's something the subcommittee would like to pursue. Uh, this would essentially involve individual committee members completing a survey between the third and the fourth meetings, unless the subcommittee believes it's in place to start that process now. Members' responses would be aggregated and presented to the subcommittee at the fourth meeting as the starting point for deliberation. So think of that as a working draft of committee recommendations. Uh, we, we recognize that, particularly with up to 25 projects plus projects that you've heard today that the subcommittee may be considering it won't be feasible for the subcommittee to be fluidly making motions on individual projects and, and actively determining a rank order. So this, this 
proposed process as a way to give the committee a starting point uh, towards that rank ordered, ordered list. Uh, I can go over the details of that process uh, in the next meeting. If you'd like me to go over it today, I'm prepared to go over it today as well. Um, but, but as I mentioned, uh, the, the first uh, decision that, that staff would need from the subcommittee is that total universe of projects that the subcommittee would like to consider so that we can, we can get a survey out to you to, to ascertain your individual. So if we came up with a total, um, survey, a total number of projects we wanted at this meeting, and then um, we looked at that, directed staff to look at that, we wouldn't need the summary, uh, we wouldn't need the valuations independent or anything if we came to an agreement at the meeting. So if, if uh, Madam Chair, if the committee were to decide at this meeting or at the next meeting that this is the universe of projects the subcommittee would like to consider, uh, at that point we would send you individually a survey to complete to submit your uh, individual proposed rank orderings of those projects and we'd bring the re results to you at the next meeting. That's also something we could do between the third and the fourth meetings. Um, okay, so what we could do today is prioritize what we heard last week um, and, and see if there's a yay or nay on all of those. And then the next meeting, maybe take it right at the first of the meeting, uh, look at the new projects that have come in and see if there's any, um, you know, uh, any prioritization of those. Okay. Madam Chair, so if, if the committee wanted to take an initial cut yeah. at rank ordering, um, what that could look like is the committee directing staff to, um, to, to be prepared to evaluate the prioritized capital needs plus or minus any additions that you've heard from discussion okay. during the last meeting. So we, we would just need to know what, what that list of projects looks like that you would like loaded to be evaluating. Okay. Members of the subcommittee, uh, we did have projects that came last week and those projects uh, were not many. It was the uh, pool house to be renovated uh, the fund that would affect all parks to be created uh, for a capital needs fund for very small projects and Esteban. So the total came to about, um, I believe it's six million almost. Uh, it, it came to six million for those projects that we heard last week. And we heard evaluations. Um, I was really pleased that the city was very flexible and would use the small fund for capital needs. Uh, I would like to go to a million, but you know, <laughs> who knows? Uh, and I, I guess the question I have to staff uh, is we have your priorities. And in order to fund some of the priorities we've heard, we have to shave off some, some of them. Uh, is there a priority for you of, say we kept all your priorities, are there any that could be cut back? Have you looked at that? Say we came up and the figure we came up with was six million. Is there enough wiggle room in your projects to work at giving us that six million so that we could fund uh, those projects? Uh, Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee, it's a great question. I wouldn't say we've looked at it exactly like that. The 13 yeah. projects that were listed in the priority list were the projects we felt had the most critical needs timing wise and impact to the community now. That second level, so there's 13 projects in the prioritized list. That second level, there's 12 projects in future capital needs. So those are equally important. They're things we know we need to get to, but we felt timing wise, those could wait, ideally maybe for the next bond, see if there's other funding opportunities between this bond and that bond, because we had some more time to get to them uh, based on maybe other projects we're doing and funds we have access to currently. And so again, those 12 were the most uh, important critically okay. that we felt. Um, we didn't present them to you in a prioritized fashion, but those were the 12 in conjunction with the city's fiscal capacity review committee and trying to create that balanced package across the entire city. But I guess into what I'm asking, out of those 12, because I know that those are top priority, and the second priority would go into perhaps another fund, another bond, uh, or if money came available if something fell through. So can you, out of those 12, can you tighten up and give us some flexibility? Uh, Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee, we could certainly go back okay. and look at those um, 13 projects and see if 
there's any additional information or ways we can try to do that and bring that information to you at your direction for the next meeting. I think you did a very good job at prioritizing. And even what we heard, you know, the, um, the North Valley, the West Valley, the new parks, but they're not built yet. And perhaps we could take a little bit from that. Uh, and then some of the other projects, if they have different things that maybe we could tighten up on, um, because our first blush that we looked at, I, unless somebody has like um, an objection to any of them, seemed worthwhile. Uh, and they, they were small projects, you know, it's not big, big. Esteban's probably the biggest. And perhaps if you could even come back with any other smaller, perhaps community center that we don't have in our system, but we could look at for Esteban if we couldn't make the four is there anything else that we could do? Um, have you looked at perhaps, you know, a different kind of structure uh, that we could start with and then make sure that they get more funding later? Um, but I, I think I would like to put that idea forward if people are in agreement with it on this committee and ask that during these next two weeks, uh, you see if you could pull six million out of the 13 priorities. We don't want, I think, to do away with any of their priorities unless somebody, you know, would like to. Um, but I think they're all worthwhile. I think the Rio Salado, even though county said they could not, you didn't think you could get county funds, um, they do have some enhancement funds. So if you don't mind, I'm going to talk um, to uh, the Board of Supervisors and see if they'd be amenable to perhaps looking at that. Um, because if we could get some from there, that might help a little bit. And then if there's any of those 13 that we could ask them to look at CDBG funding, you know, uh, perhaps that could be another request from this committee. Uh, and then the ones that come in next time, uh, next meeting that came before us, we'll look at the evaluation. But on first blush, if we could look at just tightening up and pulling the smaller projects that we had last week. Maybe we could do that and then decide where do we want to go from here. How does that sound to everybody? Could you? Yes. It, what it was, that, that it was the sense. ones that came last week to us. I know the pool house was um, uh, 1.6 million. The grant was uh, the one that we were gonna put citywide so that you could do small yeah. was 500. Uh, thousand, and then Esteban came in at four. I'm asking to see if they could tighten up Esteban a little bit, maybe give us a little bit smaller structure to begin with, uh, cut the four million down. But I'm also asking that of the 13 projects that the city prioritized, could they tighten up and pull those funds out to fund these? We, we were given those earlier. Uh, you want to go ahead and review those? Cynthia reviewed those yeah, with us Madam earlier. Chair, um, yes. subcommittee mm -hmm. member CASA and members of the subcommittee, I can go back in my presentation. The, the request two weeks ago at our first meeting um, was to bring back three specific capital, new capital projects on top of the original 13 that were presented. Um, those three in particular, the request was to bring back information on what it would cost to build uh, the small neighborhood 4,000 square foot recreation center at Esteban Park. Um, and so this slide shows what a facility like this includes, youth and teen rooms, a conference room, restrooms, access to Wi-Fi. We have two similar, very similar models of this, if you will, at two other parks in um, Southeast and Southwest Phoenix at Hermoso Parks uh, and Lindo Parks. Uh, the cost to build something like this is what we were asked to bring back. That would be about four and a half million dollars. And then the cost to the city's uh, operating budget we project would be $276,000 moving forward annually once it's built. The second capital project we were asked to bring back information on was renovating an existing 
historic bathhouse at Grant Park. So Grant Park um, has one of the pools in our regional pool model concept that would get repurposed into a splash pad. Um, the existing bathhouse is historic, so it can't be demolished. So this would be to renovate that facility, it's separate from the splash pad project, uh, but to make it a usable recreation space. Um, so there is some work which we've listed out that would be needed to be done to rehab or renovate that facility and make it usable in this way. The cost to do that is $1.6 million uh, with a projected annual ongoing impact to the city's budget of $105,000. However, we could also look at uh, partnering with the nonprofit as we already do in that park to run this space so there's a potential um, for that annual ongoing cost to not be a factor or to be less. Uh, but nonetheless, the 1.6 million would be needed to renovate that building. Uh, and the idea would be that it would be a recreation space for recreation games and activities for youth. The third project we were asked to bring back or to confirm whether or not it was possible is for $500,000. That would be a, uh, a pot of bond funds that would be available during that uh, window for neighborhoods to apply to the parks department uh, for uh, an, uh, an enhanced amenity in their park. It could be more picnic tables, benches, it could be a playground, it could be a ramada, it could be shade structure, uh, and we would have $500,000 uh, to use and to set criteria uh, in an application process where neighborhoods would then apply to us to do um, something like this. So those were the three projects. So on top of the 13 projects we brought, um, we have now added three more. It's okay. Thanks, Mike. <laughs> Just right in front of me. Thank you. Uh, that was very, very helpful to me. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, I, I have a, yes, a follow-up clarifying question. I'm not a math major. I will just start <laughs> off with that. Um, so you said that the total for, for the first projects that we came with before the, the additional six million, the total was 109 million total. That and that does not include the future stuff like the golf courses, that right? Is, that okay. is correct. That's 13 priorities. Thir so the 13 priorities plus these new priorities that we're talking about r right now, which is an additional six million. So the total then that we'd be asking for or potentially asking for is 114 million. No. What, or is what, that? What I, I was asking is that 109 that you scrub it and take six million out of that that you look at your projects, can you cut any of them down so that you would not go over the 109, but you could possibly cut a project down and uh, the end of six million. million. Mm -hmm. Okay, then, then thank you for the clarifying answer. These projects offered today would take the same processes if if we decided we wanted to decide it forward. right mm -hmm. okay we we can't really consider them today because we don't have all the information about the them information. but if we if somebody wanted to put it forward and the board decided you know the committee decided um so i think if we could do that everybody seems to be in agreement and we could do that and maybe just if we could think outside of the box on esteban and look at funding uh, a project that might be a little bit even less, um, and maybe bring some ideas to us. Okay. So, yes, Madam Ingrid? Chair, um, mm -hmm. uh, is the direction then that we come back with these three projects with a little bit more information, make it a, a one pager mm -hmm. that we take, we give you their information, we summarize it in one pager, we can send it to you mm -hmm. prior to the meeting. Yes. That way, if there's any questions you have, that'd be great. Um, you mean the projects also, that just came in? Yeah. Also, mm -hmm. we have operating, agree operating agreements with two of those organizations. We can mm -hmm. send those so you can clearly see what is our responsibility as a city that would and what be really is their good. responsibility as the organization. So yeah. we'll put that in a packet together um, with you. But what would you like us to present next time? Those three? Yes, if, well, and, if you And could, what you just asked us. Yeah, to. if you could give us the information before. Yeah. We will ask at the beginning of the meeting, is there any of these that anybody wants us to move forward on after studying them, okay? And um, we could do that. And I know it's really hard to cut things that are already kind of mapped out, 
but I do not want to go over the 109. Um, I think that will not look good as a subcommittee, and you know we would show that we worked very hard to not go over that. But I would like to fit things in if we could and just scrub it a little bit. Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee, if I can also, um, uh, much much like you um, appointed uh, Jeff Spellman to the uh, transportation yes. um, mm -hmm. uh, subcommittee, uh -huh. uh, the arts and culture subcommittee is going to hear some more information from the Parks and Recreation Department about the um, Phoenix Center for the Arts. Okay. So on Friday the 16th okay. at 9 o'clock in the morning, that's uh, that meeting is going to be uh, televised um, and on YouTube channel. Um, again, I would encourage you not to all come because there's a quorum issue. <laughs> um, but you could watch it, and if, if you needed us to either bring that back to the okay. subcommittee, that would be or well if you all watched it and had questions a as a result of it, it'd be the same presentation. So anybody, that might be helpful as well. If anybody could watch that, because that, that was something. And I really think, Ingrid, your idea to bring us back the proposals or the uh, contracts that you already have so that we know how they operate with you, okay? All right, and I'm gonna try to make that Friday one just so I could hear it, so. If anybody else is interested, uh, let Cynthia know so that we don't have a quorum problem. Madam Chair and colleagues, I have a, a another clarifying question. I'm worried that this is, we've got two more meetings left, um, and so we think, uh, Madam Chair, that maybe we we can walk and chew gum at the same time while we reevaluate these. Could we also do the ranking um, so that at the next meeting we kind of know from the 13 original projects where our committee stands on priorities? Is that something that, that we could do? Well, that's kind of the intent that we would, you know, I, I think we have to make a decision first. We wanna keep the 13 priorities. And after we make that decision, uh, we can, we, we have, I think, essentially kind of indicated that, but we've asked to scrub them to see if we could cut some money off them to fund some of the newer things. Could we, could we do that and still do the rank? I'm just worried that we'll have only two more meetings, and and there's so much need, and I we'll feel be like ranking next week. Or okay, the next at the weeks. next meeting. Yeah. Okay. So, Madam Chair, just to yes. clarify, are you wanting us to uh, provide surveys to subcommittee members between this meeting and the next meeting to come into the third meeting with your initial data, or are you wanting to well, wait until I, after I would the third meeting? Rather we do it, you know, after we see if there could be some money flexible. Okay. Um, because if you do it now, we don't have all the information, so, yeah. All right, and our next meeting is on two Mondays from today. The 18th, oh, okay. I'm sorry, 19th, the 19th okay. at one o'clock uh, okay. again here in this And we'll chamber. have had the community meeting at night, so I'll bring back any of the feedback from that, okay? Um, I'll, I'll be part of that as the chairwoman, and if anybody wants to attend, you can attend that too, but. I do have a, oh, I'm again, sorry, I would uh, just remind everybody that um, attending virtually is never a problem, but um, if you come in the same room, that could always be a problem because of the quorum okay, situation. So just turn your computers on if you want to hear. <laughs> yes, uh, it's fine. I do have a question on the meeting. Um, now, the email that I received said that there would be no staff presentation and this would only be public comment. So essentially, people would just show up and it's on them to get the information, it's on them to get the understanding of what's being cut, what's being proposed from all the other subcommittees. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee and uh, uh, member Perez, um, yes, um, it, the intent is for people to have the YouTube opportunity to watch the, the previous um, showings um, and then just provide comments based on what they've seen or what they've seen in the documents, right? The, all the documents are available too and the projects are listed and so they could give any kind of feedback on uh, those that are either prioritized or future capital needs, or maybe they have an idea that is brand new that they would bring themselves. Those are the three options I would see that they would be able to comment on. And, and they go back to the committees that um, they're germane to. Thank you, and um, a follow-up question on that is, you, you mentioned the YouTube videos. Are those provided in Spanish? I, I've only watched them in English, or is there, like if I am a, a person who does not speak English and I wanna know more about what's going on in my committee or my community, can I go on YouTube and watch those videos in Spanish? Um, Madam Chair, I do not know the answer to that, but we can get that uh, information to you. I would have to ask our communications office. Thank you, and then the other question was, I was, and I don't wanna again speak for our committee, um, but 
what other committee asked or what other subcommittee asked to have um, 6 p.m. Or, or later meetings? Were we the only ones or were there other subcommittees who wanted to have those meetings? Uh, Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee, I am not aware of any other group, but uh, Chris Fazio may know. Chris? Madam Chair, Vice Chair, uh, my recollection is uh, this is the only committee where that's actually come up in, in committee business and discussion. So there have been some, some additional for, comments, though, yeah. outside of this subcommittee. Thank you very much for accommodating us. Yeah, thank you. So my follow-up question then is, if we were the only committee who asked for those meetings, then why couldn't we have offered a Parks and Rec subcommittee meeting for the public to come speak on the issues of, of, of just the Parks and Rec? Madam Chair, uh, Madam Vice Chair, in consultation with the city manager's office and the mayor's office, um, the, the decision was to offer an executive committee meeting so that if there are members of the public who wish to speak outside of business hours, for example, or to comment on multiple subcommittees, there's a venue for them for them to do that. But no specific presentation on parks? Correct. Okay, thank you. This was, I think, the comment to, uh, or the, the, the thinking of it was kind of compromised because if we had all the presentations, it would go very, very long and we wouldn't get a lot of public comment. Yeah. So I, I think one of the things that may be good is that you'll have the bond committee chairmen there and they can take everything back because you'll still have two more hearings after that public hearing. Oh, absolutely. I just, if we were the only subcommittee who asked to have a later subcommittee meeting, then I just wondered why it couldn't just have been a Parks and Rec subcommittee meeting because we've got other folks coming to talk about fire and arts and and stuff, right? And then it would have allowed for an opportunity to have the full presentation to the community um, and for them to have that input and that, that opportunity as well. Uh, Madam Chair, Madam Vice Chair, I would, I would just add, although this was the only subcommittee where that came up as part of committee business, there have been a handful of public comments outside of this subcommittee where a similar request was, was heard. Well, I, I think the next two committees will probably get a lot of people coming in who have already been to some of the committees. Uh, they're probably gonna try to get a lot of info to all the committees, so. Okay. Thank you. All right, well, thank the city manager for accommodating that. And any other questions or discussion? I do just have one more thing, and it's, it's a process question, so uh, I, uh, at least I'm feeling the weight of the homework I have to do in the next two weeks uh, <laughs> uh, in order to do this important business justice. Uh, as we go through that process, if there are further requests for information outside of these meetings, uh, what is the proper legal way to request that information and ensure that we're complying with open meeting laws? Uh, Madam Chair, committee members, if an individual committee member had a request for information for staff, um, you, you could share that request um, either, either through Cynthia or through the um, uh, assigned staff assistant for the committee and we would we'd get that information compiled. Uh, if it's something that's pertinent to the entire subcommittee, that's something we could communicate to the entire subcommittee as well. Thank you. Okay. All right. I don't think there's any other business, and Cynthia, we didn't give you too much homework, so <laughs> thank you very much for uh, doing such a thorough job. And with that, uh, we will be adjourned. Okay. Thank you. this heat relief shelter. We've proven through the years that when we collaborate like this, we get the outcomes that are intended. Maricopa County has continued to be a partner with a lot of us throughout Maricopa County, especially with the city of Phoenix.